Hi everyone and welcome back to the next webinar in our Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk Series. My name is Katie Rogers and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things just to make sure you get the most of attending today's webinar. If you are experiencing technical issues, please let us know about those using the chat box or email me at krogers at ASPB.org. If you're having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, just know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all of the associated materials within a few days. If you have questions during today's webinar, please let us know using the GoToWebinar chat box. Benjamin Schwesinger, who is an ARC Future Fellow and Independent Group Leader at Australian National University, is with us today to moderate today's sessions and read your questions aloud to our speakers. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars, and you can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. So this is the first Plante Presents webinar series since July 1st. Be sure, if you haven't already, to check out our archive to watch all 13 talks that we did in season one of this series. You can find all of that information on our blog, and you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notifications when new recordings are posted. We took a break to prepare and attend ASPB's annual plant biology meeting, which was online this year. Um, we also took the time to read and discuss all of your survey responses that you sent in. So thank you to everyone who took the time to share your notes with us. Um, in the end, we had over 150 surveys sent, and of course there was thousands of great ideas. Science is all about innovation and exploring new ways of doing, doing things. Therefore, our steering committee, which includes Mary Williams, Jurgen klein Ben, Benjamin Schwesinger, and Javier Moreno, and myself, we've decided to experiment with some additional formats for the Plante Presents series. This way we can include more diverse speakers and my, more diverse topics. We will continue to use the standard format that we're using. Um, that's the format that we're using today. However, the dates that are listed here on this slide, we will be introducing a short talk and panel discussion format where scientists will submit open videos that will be selected by a reviewing panel for online discussions. All of these talks will be pre-recorded and then panel discussions will take live um, as, as the speakers are there. Um, so we'll be, we'll be doing the, this experiment um, and see how this new format goes. For more details, visit our blog, submit our video, or share this information with your colleagues. The first submission is going to be due on September 14th. So don't forget to visit our webpage for more information about this series. Um, all of the recordings are there and be sure to sign up if you'd like to be considered as a speaker. You can, uh, you can find us on social media at plantae underscore org and at ASPB. For those of you listening on this as a recording, feel free to reach out with us, out to us on Twitter, on our blog or email us. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Benjamin um, to introduce our speaker and Be begin the session. Thanks, Benjamin. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I think it's exciting to have you back. And a very well welcome uh, from Canberra, um, where the bottles are blooming. So it's spring over here. I uh, hope you are having a good time where you are. So it's pretty exciting to have two diverse voices speak today. So uh, first we have, we'll have Alejandra I. Prieta, and then we have Paola Reyes Caldas. And I do apologize if I don't pronounce this like completely proper with my German English accent. All right. <laughs> so I'm really excited um, to host uh, Alejandra this morning. Um, uh, she is an assistant professor of phytobacteriology in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at North Carolina State University. She obtained her BA in Arts in Spanish and Portuguese from University of California, Santa Barbara. So you can really talk with her about like literature, it's quite nice. <laughs> and uh, BS in chemistry from the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz. She earned her PhD at the University of Wisconsin, M M Madison, as an NSF graduate research fellow investigating the role of proteinaceous toxins in interspecies competition in, 
Rastonia solanarum, sorry, species complex. Uh, mm -hmm. She then pursued a postdoctoral work at Colorado State University as an NSF and USDA NF. A postdoctoral fellow to study plant host resistance mechanism to bacterial pathogen using plant Tamonas uh, species and RISE's model uh, system. She's passionate about and actively engaging various uh, efforts to promote agricultural research, effective mentoring strategies, and STEM education. Um, it's really a great pleasure to have uh, Alejandra uh, here today. And as you can see, she uh, has quite a already decoration of uh, several fellowships and such. And we will expect much more from her in future. And for now, we will pass it on for her talk today. Thank you very much, Alejandra, for joining us today. Thank you uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to present and share some of the new and exciting research that we have going on in the lab. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some continuing work that I'm doing um, in this, uh, from my follow from my postdoctoral work, and that's in pursuit of durable uh, disease resistance. Excuse me, Alejandra. Sorry. Yeah? You might want to switch your view. We see your presenter's view, so mm -hmm. you might want to switch it around. Thank you. That's you... been an issue. Um, so now that we are set up and we're ready to go, I will continue with um, In Pursuit of Durable Disease Resistance in Rice, Exploiting Effectors, Allelic Variation in Rice and Magic. Uh, so uh, my pathos system of choice to study this, the different resistance mechanisms associated with bacterial diseases is bacterial blight of rice, which is a vascular pathogen that likes to inhabit uh, the xylem vessels of rice plants. Um, this is a field in the background of what the, what the disease looks like in the wild. You can see the blight that is associated with naming the disease. Here you have two disease tissues on the left. Um, and then on the right, you have something equivalent to the hypersensitive response on a, hypersens on a resistant variety. And here you have oozing of the bacteria outside of a cut leaf. Um, and you have that yellowish pigment that's associated with the xanthan production of many xanthomonids. Bacterial blood um, is caused by the plant pathogenic bacteria xanthomonas oryzae pathovirus oryzae. And uh, for this bacteria, transcription activator-like effectors are very important for pathogenicity and virulence. Transcription activator-like effectors are produced by many Xanthomonas, especially uh, the Xanthomonas oryzae. They are translocated from the producing cell, uh, bacterial cell cytoplasm, uh, using the type three secretion system directly into the plant cell. There, they use uh, the nuclear localization signal to then be shuttled into the nucleus. And then they have an activation domain that is responsible for activating the genes uh, for which it targets. And the way that it targets the gene in the host is using this repeat variable dive residue, which is at the center of this transcription activator-like effector. So each one of these different colored boxes represents a different repeat of 20 of 33 to 34 amino acid long repeats. Position 12 and 13 of those repeats are really important and are considered the repeat variable dye residues. The repeat variable dye residues bind nucleotides on the host genome in a very specific manner. Usually, NI will bind an A, NG would bind a T, HD a C, and then an a G or an A. And the motif that they bind is called the effector binding element, abbreviated EVE from this point on. So the tail effector is able to bind this effector binding element and then activate transcription of either a susceptibility gene or an R gene. Susceptibility genes are really important in um, the biology of these different bacterial pathogens because this is the way that they modify the host environment in order to benefit their reproduction and their viability and their fitness. There's three known mechanisms for which transcriptional activate like effectors function in rice and that are transcriptional dependent. You have the case where a uh, tail effector binds the EVE of a susceptible susceptibility gene and that leads to enhanced susceptibility. The other mechanism is where the tail effector binds the effector binding element of an R gene and this leads to resistance or the hypersensitive response. And then there's a third mechanism that is the mechanism that we're going to focus on for the rest of this chat and that's where in the effector binding element, you have polymorphisms or shifts in the promoter that do not allow the tail effector to bind appropriately 
and activate transcription of the susceptibility gene. So this is a type of resistance called resistance to loss of susceptibility. And many Xanthomonas produce different types of talofectors. Um, S-strain can have anywhere from six talofectors to about 34 or 39 different talofectors. Here we have a representation of uh, different sequence strains of Xanthomonas oryzae pathovara oryzae and one of Xanthomonas oryzae pathovara oryzae, which is a close relative of Xanthomonas oryzae pathovara oryzae. And then um, here on the tree out top, you see different uh, transcription activated like effector groups. And then on the on the left, you have a tree that represents uh, the how related these strains are to each other. If you see a box in gray, that means that the the A tal effector is present in that particular strain. And you can see that some strains have multiple tal effectors and many. And then you can see that some effectors are present in just one strain or other effectors are present in a lot of strains. When we open it up, we can see that the diversity of tal effectors is gray and wide. You have some tal effectors like tal 7b that are conserved in different strains of uh, Xanthomonas oryzae, pathovara oryzae. This tal effector family, along with two others, are three of the most conserved tal effector families within uh, Xanthomonas oryzae, pathovara oryzae populations. And then you have PTHXO1 and AVRXA7, which are two well-characterized tal effectors that lead to more of an all-or-nothing type of mechanism, where uh, some of them trigger the hypersensitive response, or when they lose this, when the pathogens lose this tal effector, they lose the ability to cause disease altogether. But there's these, these other tal effectors and these other tal effector families that we still don't know what they're doing and what they're targeting. But the fact that they are conserved in multiple strains within the pathogen asks the question, what are they doing and why are they important? Why are, is the bacterial cell keeping, um, conserving them? So here we have one strain, PXO86. Um, and it's been inoculated on a susceptible variety of rice. And the wild type can lead to disease uh, symptoms that lead to lesion lengths of about 23 centimeters long. When you remove AVRXA7, which I mentioned earlier was all of, one of these major effect tal effectors, you get significant reduction in uh, disease. They lose about the ability to, to um, they decrease their ability to cause disease by about 12 centimeters long, and this is considered a major effect, tal effector. You have other effectors like AVRXA7. So here is a double mutant where you have AVRXA7 and AVRXA10. We have to keep AVRXA7 um, mutated because if we don't, we are not able to see some of the minor effects of some of the uh, smaller tal effectors. In this case, AVRXA7 has no effect whatsoever on this uh, rice background. And then you have other tal effectors like tal7b, where there is a significant yet not as large uh, tal effector uh, disease um, defect, and this is considered a minor effect tal effector. So we know that Xanthomonas or IC strains carry multiple effectors. We know that uh, different effectors contribute to pathogen and virulence different, uh, differently, and then you have some that, that are considered major tal effectors and some that are consider considered minor tal effectors. They're conserved in a pathogen population. So we wanted to take advantage of this so we can understand what the contribution of these minor effect tal effectors are to pathogen fitness, um, and then also help us predict uh, durable disease resistance. So the goal is to identify novel sources of resistance that target a minor effect tal effector, in this case, tal7b. And to do that, we used magic. Um, yes, I hope it was, I was hoping it would be like the hocus pocus type of magic, but we actually used a better strategy than just hocus pocus. And for this, we, uh, I would like to thank Emily DeLorean and Dr. Ana Bosa Castro that helped with the phenotypic experiment of this. So if, if you don't know what a magic population is, a magic population is a population used a lot in breeding, and they're generated from eight elite varieties of uh, lines of rice. These eight parents are recombined, and this high, uh, this recombination between the eight parents leads to higher recombination in a population, which improves uh, mapping resolution, allowing us to identify novel traits or novel genes of interest, uh, depending on what we're screening for 
in that population. So we took advantage of the magic lines and we took 330 lines of this magic population and we did genotype by sequencing. We identified 14 different SNPs when we did this, and then we phenotyped this 330 lines with a strain of PXO99 carrying an empty vector and PXO99 carrying TAL7B, overexpressing that particular TAL effector. We did leaf clip inoculations. After 14 days, we measured the lesion length on each of these different lines, and we uh, did triplicates for each of these different uh, lines uh, and treatment uh, experiments. We then analyzed the data using two mechanisms, genome-wide association studies and interval mapping. Um, and the first question that we had was, can the magic population detect a minor effect tal effectors? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Here on the x-axis, you have PXO99 carrying the empty vector and PXO99 carrying tal7b. On the y-axis, you have lesion length. And overall, when tal7b was present with PXO99, the lesion lengths were higher by approximately 3.1 centimeters. The other thing that we noticed when we looked at the entire population and their uh, phenotypic response to the empty vector and TAL7B is that uh, there, was, um, there was segregation of the population. So on the top, we have the results for the empty vector. On the x-axis, you have the number of lines that um, the, the lesion length associated to a particular uh, to a particular strain, and then on the y-axis you have the number or the frequencies of, of brown inferent lines that had that particular phenotype. Um, and you can see that it's a normal distribution. About 24 lines were more resistant than the more resistant parent, and one line was more susceptible than the more susceptible parent in the presence of the empty vector. When we use TAL7B to screen the population, once again, there was a normal distribution, and about 32 lines were more resist resistant than the more resistant parent, but 96 lines were more susceptible than the more susceptible parent. So this led us to um, deduce that there were susceptibility and resistance genes that we were uncovering by using the magic population and screening with these two bacterial pathogens, one carrying TAL7B and one carrying the empty vector. The next question was, are there novel QTLs for resistance and susceptibility um, using this strategy? And the answer to that is yes, overall. So with PXO9 empty vector, we were able to identify two different um, uh, QTL, one on chromosome 5 and one on chromosome 11. The one on chromosome 5 uh, corresponds to the um, XA5 gene, which is a non-transcriptionally dependent mechanism of resistance that's um, present in many uh, rice varieties. And then when we looked at uh, the lines, um, the lines when screened with PXO99 TAL7B, we see that uh, we identified the same QTL on chromosome 5 and the same QTL on chromosome 11, but we also identified unique QTLs to TAL7B on chromosome 8, 11, and 12. When we combine this data with an interval mapping population, we identify a total of 18 QTL for PXO99 carrying the empty vector and PXO99 carrying TAL7B. But there was only six QTL that were unique to the strain carrying TAL7B. So the next question we had are, are there TALs that um, are targeted under this QTL? under these QTLs. So we combined our ability to take the genome-wide association studies, the interval mapping, use our ability to predict TAL effector, uh, TAL effector targets using TALVES or TALENS, and then do a genome-wide study to identify new targets. We did this looking first at how many targets we could find genome-wide, and the other one, how many targets we can find within the QTL of interest. Here we have chromosome one of rice, um, and then you see these uh, magenta and these blue bars. The magenta bars correspond to the QTL that were specific to TAL7B. The CIN lines were specific to QTL for PXO99 as a strain. And then the black bars represent previously described QTL in the literature. These little perpendicular lines to the bars represent the number of predicted TAL7B targets in that particular QTL. 
So when we open it up to all of the chromosomes of interest where we found uh, QTL specific for Tal7b, we were able to find that within these different QTLs, there was more than one QTL and less than 50, more than one Tal7b target and up to 50 sync targets, depending on the size of the QTL. For example, here on QTL1, we have 27, QTL3, 56, and then one over here on chromosome 12. What was really exciting is that we were able to identify uh, key QTLs, this one on chromosome 8 and this one on chromosome 12, that were completely new and had not been reported in the literature before. We then decided to take advantage of the 3000 Rice Genome Project and the that, Im that immense resource that, that's available, and then uh, look within our tal effector gene targets um, in the rice population and identify or see if there were any polymorphisms in these regions. So if you remember from the introduction, I talked to you about uh, tal effectors being able to bind the effector binding element and activating susceptibility gene looking for enhanced and leading to enhanced resistance. And then there's the option of no activation if the EBE is missing or the promoter region has been shifted. So if we're able to identify that there's um, SNPs or polymorphisms in the promoter region, this might lead to the loss of susceptibility and we could potentially engineer plants or rice to um, deactivate tal effector binding and activation of that target gene. So when we looked at these different uh, genes, we identified 153 total genes within the QTL and the majority of them had polymorphisms either in the effector binding element, like you see in this gene in chromosome one, gene 15790 of rice, where there's one, there's polymorphism on one on the on the predicted effector binding element of that particular gene. Here you have the eight different magic founders, and then the sequence that corresponds, an alignment with the sequence that corresponds for each of these different lines. Then you had other um, polymorphisms within the promoter where you had the effector binding element domain and you had polymorphisms upstream of that particular binding element. And that potential, that, that shift can lead to uh, non-functional or a tal effector not being able to bind. Um, then you had other instances when there were uh, insertions or deletions in the effector binding element, breaking the ability of the tal effector to bind, such as you see on this gene on chromosome three, and then, this one on chromosome eight, where three of the magic parents lost uh, the effector binding element altogether, and there's a significant chunk of DNA missing in the promoter of that uh, putative susceptibility gene. So overall, this was very exciting for us because we were able to correlate the predicted TAL7B with uh, their target, their gene targets, and also identify different um, polymorphisms that might impact the ability of TAL7B to bind and activate these different susceptibility genes. So then um, to summarize up till now, we were able to use the magic lines and um, identify resistance and susceptibility to one minor TAL effector. We identified seven novel resistance QTL for TAL7B, and there was 153 TAL7B targets under these QTL. But these are all targets predicted. A lot of this is bioinformatic. So then, we know from our magic lines that we can always go back to our magic lines and then retest them. So that's what we did. We went back to our magic lines and we looked at uh, lines that had changes in the promoter region um, of the, um, the QTL on chromosome eight because it was really unique. So we identified uh, different lines that had different, um, that had allelic variation in this QTL and we rescreened them for TAL7, rescreened them for TAL7B. And here you have the number of the line. We use Nippenbari as the control. And then in the bottom, you have the empty vector or the strain carrying TAL7B. And on the y-axis, you have lesion lines. And in a subset of that population, we found that in the presence of TAL7B, the lesion lengths were longer than, the, than in the empty vector. And this correlates to the model where the TAL effector is able to bind the EBE and activate uh, the, suscept the targeted susceptibility gene. Then when we looked at the other subset of those lines, like 24, 163, 197, and 210, uh, 
um, there was no significant difference in the lesion lengths whether the tau effector was there or not. And this leads to the model where there's no activation of the susceptibility gene. So yes, we can see this in a phenotype, but now the question is, are the predicted tau7b gene targets in the matching lines really disease susceptibility genes? And to do that, we're working with Dr. Jose Huat Tapia at the University of Florida, and Dr. Ying Yu Liao here in the lab is furthering this work, where we did an RNA-seq uh, experiment with uh, seven total lines, uh, magic lines, uh, three of them resistant and four of them susceptible, susceptible with two of the parents to try to understand and further narrow down the number of predicted tau targets, tau7b targets in the magic population and identify novel resistance or susceptibility genes that can be used in our breeding strategies. And just to show you a little snippet of what we're finding, here we have susceptible line 13 and on the right, we have resistant line 210. Overall, we are identifying and we are noticing that some of the same genes that had poly predicted polymorphisms that are tau7b targets are differentially expressed in the susceptible and the resistant line. So we're currently in the process of narrowing down the number of our predicted gene targets to continue the functional work um, to better understand how tau7b, this minor effect virulence factor, is contributing to disease and to disease virulence and pathogenicity and Xanthomonas oryzae pathovar oryzae. So overall, we were able to use the magic lines of huge resource that is showing to be very useful in identifying novel uh, QTL for resistance and susceptibility. Um, if you need this, if you want to work with the magic population, Erie makes them available to the public. You just need to get in contact with them. We were able to identify seven novel resistance QTL for TAL7B, um, two of them being completely unique to TAL7B, and one of them we're further exploring, and that's uh, the QTL on chromosome 8. There's a total of 153 TAL targets that are under these QTL, and we have proposed that the uh, QTL on the genes in QTL uh, 8 um, will function as a, as a source of resistance through loss of susceptibility. And that's something that we're working on in the lab. So with that, I would like to thank Dr. Ying Yu Liao, who's actually conducting a lot of the work now, um, and Dr. Jose Huat Tapia, who is uh, helping and mentoring Ying Yu Liao with a lot of the bioinformatic work that is associated with working with seven different uh, magic lines, two different treatments, um, and a lot of data. Also, Emily DeLorean and Dr. Ana Rosa Castro for doing the uh, greenhouse inoculations that allowed us to identify these novel QTL. Dr. Alvaro Perez Quintero, who helped with the initial identification of TAL7B gene targets. And Aaron Doyle, um, and Aaron Doyle and uh, Jose, Dr. Ying Yulao, and Francisco at Cornell were working together to now further pipeline these different um, data. So somebody can go in and uh, identify a new QTL and see if there's any TAL7B genes that, um, with Xanthomonas, if there's any TAL targets associated to a particular QTL um, and so forth. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Exciting talk. Um, and also one of my uh, favorite model systems. Um, so uh, there was a general question, um, which is a little bit specific to the Xanthomonas rice interaction. So Xanthomonas rice pasta system is one of the pasta systems where you don't have a lot of MBSLR genes which actually recognize Xanthomonas, um, the pathogen. Can you speculate? Why this is? Well, um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, I think it has to do a little bit um, with, in particular, with Xanthomonas oryzae. I think it's, um, it probably has to do a lot with the mechanisms that 
xanthan monocerasi uses against its toast. Um, and unlike other xanthan monads, for example, that do interact with uh, their host and have some of these MBLR type of, of resistance gene, um, the resistance genes that are associated with um, with xanthan monocerasi, they're they're activated by transcription by TELS, so they're transcriptionally activated. Um, I think it's just coevolution of the of the host and the bacteria. Um, I, that's a tough one, Benjamin. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, because. All right. You know, um, yeah. Go, go ahead. No, like Xanthomonas really uvicicatoria, Xanthomonas campestris, they have anywhere between three to five tal effectors. Um, and, you know, they do have a few other, like the host, tomato and pepper, there are some major R genes. Um, so that's a, I'm going to look into that. Okay. All right, maybe a more specific question to your talk next. <laughs> uh, so, so there was a question from Kida Coker, and she was asking, are these R and S, so resistance to septal QTLs, specific to Xanthomonas, or do you see them also potentially playing a role to other vascular pathogens? So um, we went, when we did our initial screen and we identified the 153 uh, genes, um, of interest, uh, a subset of those genes are associated with QTLs for some fungal diseases and viral diseases of rice, um, but in particular to, um, that's in, in the rice system. And then when we looked at some of the broader genes and looking at other pathosystems, there's a couple of sink fingers that are actually of high interest to us right now because they are, um, they're showing to be either upregulated or downregulated in the interaction. And we know that some sink fingers are associated with resistance and susceptibility in other hosts. Um, there's also a couple, there's one CERC that's of interest as well. And um, this CERC gene um, is really close to one of the QTLs, but doesn't lie within it. And it's the QTL on chromosome eight which is that new QTL. So we know that CERC plays a role in um, the immune response of many different hosts um, out there, such as Arabidopsis and tomato and a few other ones. So I think there's some overlap. And once we narrow down our, our number of genes, I think we'll, we'll be able to, hopefully I'll be able to tell you a little bit more of the specific ones and how they function in this particular pathosystem. All right, two more questions for now, but uh, then we have to move on. The one question is, so, mm, all right, it's my own question, so I have to formulate it still in my head. Um, so you have this resource of like these uh, 3,000 rice lines, or like many rice lines, you have a research of all of these potential genomics of these xanthomonas of uh, rice with all the different tiles. So could you actually computationally predict um, some of these promoters and therefore also your res uh, resistance and susceptible genes in a combinatorial manner? Uh, yes, we can do that. Um, it, it's, it's easier said than that, of course. But um, so with our ability, there's already one, um, there's one website um, and database that's available. And that's the database website. And it's hosted by uh, uh, the, the group over in France, um, and if anybody's interested, I can put it in the chat. And they combine RNA seq uh, RNA seq data. They also combine uh, tau prediction software, and they also combine um, looking at promoter regions. And all of this is really great, and it helps us identify specific. Um, specific uh, targets or putative genes of interest or possible uh, polymorphisms. But the question is that we don't really know which one is functioning and which one's the actual real target of TAL7B. Furthermore, I haven't identified or we don't know of a, of a particular program yet or database that's including um, previously uh, reported or new uh, QTL data as it comes out. And um, when I was doing this work and looking for previously reported QTL, it was actually really exciting 
because there's a lot of really historical um, research out there um, looking at resistance and susceptibility to many hosts and rice being one of them. Um, so how can we incorporate that? And also the, the mapping resolution has um, really advanced in the last 20, 20 years. So it's allowing us to get closer to the particular area of interest, um, which also contributes to decreasing gene drag induced and doing, um, doing different breeding strategies. Um, so yes, that's something that we're looking into doing to um, generate a database where we can combine all this data. And that's what Dr. Yin Yu Liao is doing and with the help of uh, Dr. Jose Hubat Tapia and Aaron Doyle and Francisco Augusto at Cornell University. That's very exciting. Okay, let's have a, one last quick answer to a quick question um, because then we have to pass on. So there was like one question about from Tanya um, about what are these genes which are responsible for the enhanced susceptibility to tal 7 b So do you have any of the function? What are these genes? Um, so um, I didn't I didn't want to present, but we've actually gone in and do a network analysis of some of these genes that up, are upregulated, downregulated, um, and a more than half of the genes that are associated are somehow um, associated to biotic and abiotic stress. So um, these genes that TAL7B is targeting, and what we're thinking is that these conserved minor effect TAL effectors are actually targeting more than one gene. Um, and it's all sort of this quantitative susceptibility type of mechanism, um, is that these different genes that they're targeting are either helping the bacterium uh, make the, well they're definitely helping the bacteria make that particular environment more hospitable for it either by providing food um combating the immune uh response which which is something you know that they constantly need to do because the plant is in in constant worry of they don't want to die so it's pretty much um activating these genes or deactivating these genes in order to um to be happy and be able to multiply um. Cool, thank you. Um, there are a couple, couple more questions which we won't get to right now. We will pass them on to you and then you maybe can ask, uh, uh, ask. God, I can't talk today, answer them um, later on. Uh, okay, thank Great. you very much. That was a very exciting talk and thank you for presenting your latest work. Thank you. All right, so we move on to our second speaker of the day, and we hope that we'll work all out, um, which is Paola Reyes-Caldis. She's in, in investigating the role of Candidus Labriobacter solanus iarum effectus activity in solanaceous hosts. Paola is a PhD candidate at uh, Gita Cocos Lab, currently investigating the activity and targets of Candidus Labriobacter solanus iarum effectus in tomato. Originally from Colombia, she received her undergraduate and ma master's in market biology at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. In 2017, she received a Fulbright scholarship to pursue a PhD degree in plant pathology at the University of California, Davis. I'll be exciting to have you. Exciting also to have like a PhD student talk in this series because we want to uh, promote all uh, ways of uh, people to talk here. So it's great. I hear that we um, might have uh, some problems in between. So if it cuts out, uh, then we see how we go. All right, Paola, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. So, okay. So as we, I think, organize, uh, Katie will do the slides and you can take two slides. Oh yeah, see, here they are. Great, so we won't see Paola because of some internet and computer issues, but she will uh, talk to us anyway. Thank you very much and take it away. I would like to start thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my research here today in this seminar series. Uh, as Benjamin mentioned, I'm Paola Reyes and I'm a PhD candidate in the Coker Lab. And I'm not a plant biologist exactly, I'm a microbiologist and um, however, I feel like 
fascinated about how plant pathogens can cause disease in their plant hosts and can manipulate them. Um, so today I will be talking about a relatively unknown uh, plant pathogen, Candidatus liberibacter solanacearum, and its salonaceous host. And I would also like to highlight some limitations and opportunities I have encountered um, working with this pathosystem. So if you have ever heard, oh, Katie, thank you. If you have ever heard of um, uh, the genus Liberibacter, you are probably wondering why. Why I decide to, or why I choose to study a foreign limited non-cultural plant pathogen. And the reason to me is very obvious. In the past years, a lot of emerging pathogens have arisen as um, um, pathogens of crops, and they can be devastating. Just to give you an example, the whole citrus industry in Florida has been decimated by uh, the Juan Blomblin disease, also known as HLB or citrus greening. Therefore, um, plant pathogenic fluent limited bacteria are actually threats for food security. And because we don't know enough about um, uh, the interaction with the host, we are not able to deploy efficient um, management in the field. On top of that, um, fluent limited bacteria are vectored by insects, and we know insects' uh, movement is um, increasing with climate change. Also, um, we know these uh, fluent limited bacteria actually um, have an, a very uh, intimate interaction with both the uh, vector and the host, and therefore this is known as a tractophic interaction. Now, talking about um, the economical uh, repercussions, uh, phytoplasmas and liberibacters are the most important fluent uh, limited bacteria. Phytoplasmas are known for causing um, several uh, modifications to the plant and morphology. And they can be vectored by several insects and they cause a disease in multiple hosts. On the other hand, liberibacters have a more um, narrow host range and they can be vectored or they are vectored specifically by psyllids. And as I mentioned before, uh, one of the most important um, pathogens in this group is uh, Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus, the causal agent of HLB. Notice that uh, one of the most characteristic symptoms of this disease is an uneven mottling and chlorosis. And I would like to go back to the pathosystem I'm working with, Candidatus liberibacter solanacearum. And which I will denominate from now on LSO, which is vectored by the potato and tomato psyllid Bactericera coquerelli and can infect uh, different solanaceous hosts, including tomatoes. Now, in this phylogeny, I'm showing you um, how Liberibacter solanacearum LSO is closely related with Liberibacter that are able to cause disease in citrus. Um, also notice that uh, LSO uh, forms distinctive genetic groups or haplotypes, and these haplotypes vary in host, geographical localization, and vector association. For example, haplotypes A and B are found in America and they infect solanaceous hosts. Also, because of the relatedness of LSO to Liberibacter asiaticus, LSO can be used as a more tractable system with relevance to a study A shall be. Now, in order to be successful pathogens, uh, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, oomycetes, and insects deliver, uh, secrete outside uh, small proteins or effectors. And these effectors can be apoplastic or intracellular. And they are absolutely indispensable for uh, pathogenicity. Most of the best characterized effectors are, uh, play a role in, in immune suppression. However, there are other effectors like the phytoplasma effectors 
that can induce um, changes in the plant metabolism and the plant development, causing symptoms like witch's broom, which is an excessive branching, or phyllody, that is like a retrogressive uh, development from, flow, from the flower to leaves. With this information, my research question is to understand how LSO effectors facilitate disease development. I'm particularly interested in understanding if there are common strategies that are used across fluent limited bacterial pathogens. To address this question, the first thing that I needed to know is which uh, effectors LSO carries. We know that LSO doesn't encode for the major secretion systems that other gram-negative pathogenic bacteria uses to secrete effectors. However, it carries um, a whole sex secretion system With this information, we um, with this information, we um, predicted the effect of repertoire. Um, using publicly uh, available genomes, we predicted proteins that have a signal peptide and basically cure uh, proteins that uh, carry uh, transmembrane proteins, uh, transmembrane domains, and where um, big and have like a hypothetical function that were not related with the um, with the factors and something very interesting about this um, about the effector repertoire is that most of the proteins that we found that are secreted uh, varies between 8 to 25 kilodaltons and in addition all the majority of proteins that we found are hypothetical proteins that doesn't share any similarity to other um, to proteins of other organisms. Now, in the graph on the right, I'm showing you the number of effectors per haplotype. And you can see there that there are some effectors that are shared between um, all the four haplotypes, and we denominate these effectors core. But the majority of effectors are variable. And uh, that means that they are shared between two or three effectors, but not all of them. And there are a lot of effectors that are actually um, unique to each haplotype. In general, the SEC the set effector repertoire of LSO varies between 30 and 40 effectors. Now, when we group, um, or when we classify the different haplotypes based on the presence, absence of effectors and the percent of amino acid identity, um, we can see that haplotypes A and B cluster together. And this is important because if you remember, haplotypes A and B actually uh, can both infect solanaceous host. With this information, I select 27 effectors to the next steps. My next question was to understand which effectors are actually important for the interaction with the host. And to do this, I evaluate the expression of the different effectors, both in the psyllid and in the plant, um, using qPCR. To do this, I inoculated um, a small uh, tomato plants of two weeks with five psyllids and 72 hours uh, post uh, transfer I removed or collected the psyllids and reserved them for RNA extraction. Four weeks uh, after the transmission, I collected the originally inoculated leaf and used it for RNA extraction. In this graph, I'm showing you the effectors that were consistently expressed out of the 23 that were evaluated. As you can see here, there are some effectors that are uh, that are preferentially expressed in the plant, and while others are preferentially expressed in the psyllid. These effectors are important probably because they serve or have a role in the colonization of the plant. However, this result was surprising for me because I was expecting more effectors to be expressed in the plant. So I wonder what would have happened if instead of uh, testing the effector expression of 
four weeks, I have uh, tested the expression at earlier time points. We know that several filamentous pathogens, including Phytophthora, exhibit ways of effector expression. And these different waves uh, depends on the uh, pathogen lifestyle. In addition, these flow limited bacteria have like very or spend long periods inside the plant that varies with, like from months in a tomato up to years in a woody plant like a citrus. So to test this hypothesis, um, I follow the same methodology, but instead of, but this time I collect samples one week and four weeks after vector transmission. And the result of this part are still preliminary, but I wanted to share it with you because we actually were able to see um, a, a, like a changes in the expression profile. As you can see in this heat map where um, red uh, represents effect, uh, genes that are most expressed in the plant rather than the, in the insect. And you can see clearly that there are two suites of effectors. The effectors that are expressed at one week and the effectors that are more expressed at four weeks. And this is an interesting result because we have never seen waves on or in uh, flow limited pathogens. And second, because uh, the differential expression in time of these effectors could also indicate that they have different roles. For example, effectors that are expressed early like, at one week could play a role in plant defense suppression, while effectors that are expressed late could play a role, for example, in um, changing the metabolism. Part of the reason I mentioned these are still preliminary results is because flow limited bacteria actually have a very low titer sometimes, and they also exhibit patchy distribution. So this typicals the sampling. However, I'm in the process of developing um, enriched, enriched protocols that hopefully will allow me to dissect more times and get like um, a more clear um, panorama of uh, the uh, effect or expression over time. In summary of this part, I show you that LSO carries a variable sex dependent effect of repertoire. I also show you that uh, there are like, the haplotypes that infect the same host share more effectors than those infecting different hosts. And I show you that the effectors exhibiting dynamic, exhibit dynamic expression in host and psyllid with evidence of dynamic effector expression over the time of, over the course of infection. Now, I would like to focus on how these effectors actually manipulate the plant. And we know that uh, uh, phytoplasma and liberibacter effectors are actually mobile. They can move far from the point of, of infection in the phloem and they can move um, cell to cell via plasmodesmata. So we wonder um, where LSO effectors are localized and what could be their possible targets. To start answering this question, I generate uh, N terminal fusions with Turbo GFP and evaluate the subcellular localization after agrotransient expression in Nicotiana ventamiana. As you can see in these confocal images, the majority of effectors of LSO exhibit a nuclear and cytoplasmic localization. However, there are two effectors in particular that um, exhibit like an interesting subcellular localization. Texistine is a small peptide that carries both a monopartite and a bipartite nuclear localization signal. And when we evaluate its expression, we can see that it localizes in the nucleus, specifically in the nuclear speckles. Which, uh... Okay, which there was a video and they are very nice to see under the microscope because they move very fast and they are cute. Now, in the other hand, SEC19 is a small peptide also, but it doesn't carry any uh, localization signal and it doesn't have any predicted domain. When we express SEC19 in Nicotiana ventamiana, we can see that it localized in the nucleus
And an interesting observation that we made is over time, we can see the majority of nucleus are surrounded by chloroplasts. And these chloroplasts seems to be fluorescent themselves. We know this is not an artifact because we can see that TGFP sec 19 is being expressed at 48 hours. So we wonder if sec 19 could actually relocalize from the nucleus to the chloroplast. This will be very interesting because the chloroplast actually is uh, involved in several defense processes. Part of the reason I'm very excited about SEC16 and SEC19 is because we know phytoplasma effectors also target plant nuclei. If you remember, phytoplasmas are uh, responsible of um, inducing drastic morphological changes in plants. Um, for example, in this uh, image on the left, you can see clearly that a transient expression of SAT11, an effector of a phytoplasma, induces um, or phenocopies uh, disease symptoms, in this case, dwarfism and witches brown like excessive shooting. And in order to have the outcome, sub-11 targets uh, or destabilize transcription, TCP transcription factors. And one interesting thing is like the outcome is not only changes in the leaf morphology, but the destabilization of the, the TCPs can also um, affect the jasmonic acid levels uh, increasing the fecundity of the vector and therefore um, enhancing the fitness of the pathogen. And we know LSO also induces morphological changes in carrot. For example, it has been reported that it can cause uh, several um, vegetative disorders and uh, stunting. And in our lab, we have also observed ourselves how LSO can induce uh, different uh, morphological changes, including shortening of the internodes, losing the apical meristem um, uh, um, fate, uh, excessive branching, curling, mottling and chorosis, and stunting of leaflets. So this is very exciting times for LSO. And I think like if we keep like uh, investigating the targets of SEC16 and SEC19, we will also be able to understand if definitely there are common strategies between um, flow and limited pathogens. In conclusion, LSO effectors SEC16 and SEC19 targets eukaryotic subcellular compartments, indicating host manipulation. In the future, um, I will like try to identify the plant targets of SEC16 and SEC19 and evaluate if they have a, a role in modification of plant architecture and metabolism or plant defense. One, two outstanding questions in the field are if how these effectors move cell to cell and if LSO effectors can actually uh, be recognized in adjacent cells by immune receptors. With this, I would like to acknowledge all the members of the Coker Lab, especially my advisor, Gita Coker, for her support, and Sri Tapa who, for his insightful advice in the bioinformatic analysis. And also our collaborators, uh, Claire Casti, that uh, has been, uh, has given invaluable feedback on the methodology and Laura Perilla, who was the a former student of the Castile Lab that actually was the person that initiated the um, expression essays. And with that, I would like to take some questions. Thank you very much, Paola. Sorry, Louis, no, you were like, yeah, no, you were like a boss, I think it was great. Uh, really nice presentation. Um, so, so a couple of questions, I would maybe start with this one. So you show this differential expression of your effectors in your LSO uh, at, during the time of mm -hmm. infection. So do you know also if you see any like differential expression in other, due to other responses like different plant genotypes, different vector genotypes, or like different um, like temperatures and so on? Well, 
Uh, I haven't explored yet those questions in LSO, but I know uh, in Liberibacter asiaticus, they have been tested and you can see a differential expression over time. So uh, follow on question would be, so do you think this is this, this differential expression is a response to a change of the environment or like how do you, so it does a, Phytoplasma actually sense the environment, but how is it actually encoded? Do you have any ideas about this? I have no idea. Um, my and it's kind of hard to test because these are non-cultural bacteria. But I'm imagining there are um, keys from the environment that these bacteria can sense. And as I mentioned before, there are like uh, different uh, filamental pathogens that regulate uh, the expression um, depending of their life strategy. And to do that, they use like different promoters or different uh, transcription factors that are responsive to different clues in the environment. So like a good approach to this will be actually examine if there are like some kind of conserved sequences in the uh, promoters that uh, are shared between the vectors that uh, show the same expression patterns. Yeah, that's a, a, a great idea. I would be interesting to know um, because I think we always oversimplify these pathogens as just being like stuff which infects. But I think the uh, sense environment actually quite a bit. All right, so there was another uh, question. So you showed again <laughs> around the uh, differential expression over time. So did you only check the variable effectors or also the co effectors? Um, when you looked at this differential expression? I also look at the core effectors and uh, at the beginning as four months uh, post uh, vector transmission, you can only see SEC16 and SEC20 that are core effectors uh, uh, more expressed in the, in the plant. But at earlier time points, you can see more core effectors being expressed. Um, however, I don't want to make any conclusions about the expression at earlier time points because these are still um, uh, I still have to repeat these experiments. Cool. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for taking the deep dive today and presenting like uh, really well. And um, I think lots of people also enjoy listening to the recording. So thank you both uh, to Paola and uh, Alejandro today. That will wrap it up our new start for the Plant Percent series. One last thing, as Katie mentioned at the beginning, we're also trying to experiment with different formats. So one new format will be like a series of short talks, which followed by a panel discussion. And the specific on this is that everybody can submit, and all of these videos will be actually presented on. Uh, on, on YouTube and the idea is really to generate a little bit of a discussion within the community on different topics uh, and also maybe enable new collaborations from people also maybe not in 3S or in Europe but also like from um, South America, Africa and so on so do you have a little good uh, discussions and future collaborations and also yeah. maybe have like higher level discussions to um, about uh, different fields in plant science and related uh, disciplines. So without uh, further ado, thank you for both speakers for today. I think it was an excellent and exciting start um, to the session two of our series. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you all.